Hi, this is uh, John Sarver, and uh, this is my solar story, uh, uh, sponsored by the Great Lakes Renewable Energy Association and Michigan Solar Users Network. And tonight, uh, Richard Lund, who's a uh, professor at Michigan State University, is going to uh, give us a, provide us an interesting uh, presentation, uh, both about his research at, at MSU about transparent solar, and also about his uh, solar installation at his own home. And uh, please mute yourself until we get to the question and answer period. And, and with that, uh, uh, Richard, why don't you get started? Wonderful. Uh, so thank you for the, the invitation to be here. Uh, as I was saying uh, just a few minutes ago, I really like to talk to people, uh, anybody really, who's interested in renewable energy, solar energy, and electrification. So uh, if anybody has questions, feel free to, to chime in, and um, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards or uh, via email as well. And so what I want to do today is talk about some of the research that we do, talk about solar in general, and also how all of this ties together with elect electrification and particularly with electric vehicles. All of these things are really important when they integrate together. So my research group, I started about 10 years ago at Michigan State, and we focus on what we call nanostructure materials. And that means that they have a feature size on the length scale of nanometers. And this spans a wide range of materials from inorganic uh, colloidal quantum dots on one side to organic molecules on the other side. And we have lots of interesting materials sort of in between. Colloidal quantum dots, um, basically if you take a material and cut it in half, you don't expect the material properties to change. But this is where quantum materials differ. So if you keep cutting and cutting and cutting in half, cutting in half, eventually you get small enough that now every time you cut it, the properties change. The band gap or the color of the material will change. Uh, the electronic properties will change. And so that's one of the reasons why these are really exciting, interesting materials. On the organic side of things, we can change the properties by changing the chemical structure. So we synthesize new molecules. Uh, we can formulate organic molecules into salts. So it's like sodium chloride, but instead of sodium and chloride, we're gonna actually use organic molecules as the cation and the anion. So there's a whole variety of these materials that we are playing with. And we're excited about them because they enable a lot of tunability. Uh, we can process them at low temperatures and on flexible substrates. So we can make new form factors for devices. And we get actually unique properties that people haven't really fully exploited yet. And I'm gonna show you one example of that today and uh, the new kinds of solar cells. But in general, people have been thinking about these materials for uh, trying to make so solar lower cost and for doing light emitting diodes. How many of you, you can raise your hand, how many of you have an OLED a Samsung phone. How many of you have a Samsung phone? Okay, quite a few. I see a few hands. Okay, how many of you have an Apple phone? You all have OLED, <laughs> unless it's an old one, in which case you might have LCD. But every new Apple phone and Samsung phone has basically an OLED, and that's using organic molecules in every pixel. Each pixel is a different color. It's a different organic molecule. That's um, a great example of successful organic electronics. And that's an area we've been involved in for a long time and continue to be. And so this is sort of a snapshot of our group. And I think the animations are all a little screwy here. So I'm just going to, oh, they really popping around. OK, that's really weird. Um, but just to sort of uh, emphasize the areas that we um, try to understand these materials, we first try to understand the synthesis. Uh, we synthesize a whole range of materials, and then we actually try to grow them into uh, thin films to integrate them into devices. And we try to understand their crystal structure and their crystalline properties, try to get them to order. Uh, we then do applications like converting light to electricity, which is solar photovoltaics. We do the opposite, where we convert electricity to light. That's OLEDs. Uh, we then also do convert conversion of electricity to fuels or storage of that electricity. And the last more recent um, area that we've gotten into recently with my life is taking these solar cell materials and actually showing that we can turn them into really good cancer therapeutics. So that's just a snapshot of how we apply these materials. I'm gonna focus on the solar side of things uh, today. And you could ask yourself, why do we focus on solar? Why are you guys all here for a you know, Michigan solar story? And this should motivate you as to why solar in particular is so important. 
So if you look at the total uh, energy that we consume at any given moment, it's 16 terawatts. So you take up all the joules over a year and you divide that by year, that's a rate, so it's a watt uh, joule per second. So at any given moment, we're using 16, 16 to 18 terawatts uh, across the planet. So it's a very large number. Terawatt is 10 to the 12th. So we can ask a simple question. What renewable energy resource can we use to actually offset this energy consumption renewably? And this was a question that really got me going um, in the directions that I've gone in. So, uh, you know, if you dam every river, you can ask how much potential is there in hydroelectric? Actually, hydroelectric is one way that we get a lot of renewable energy today. Um, and where we can do it without making a huge environmental impact, we should do it. Uh, but if we look at the total potential, it's only a small fraction of what we need. It's currently a large, uh, a relatively large amount of our renewable portfolio, but there's not a, a, a massive potential. There's not enough to power the whole world just with hydroelectric. So we can do the same sort of analysis with terrestrial wind. So everywhere where we can put wind turbines, uh, where there's a certain velocity, you need a certain class velocity, class three, it will push the turbines around. You can ask how much is potential is there. Again, a relatively small fraction of what we need, but still big numbers. And where we can do this without making an environmental impact, we should do this. We can increase that number if we can go higher into the atmosphere, but that becomes challenging because we don't know how to necessarily get the energy back down to the, to the planet's surface. So um, there, is, there is substantial potential in wind. As we get to biomass, actually quite a bit more. Um, this is an area that MSU has been a real leader um, in developing and deploying biomass for renewable energy um, purposes. This is like ethanol. Um, so growing corn for ethanol that you can then add into fuels. So substantial potential, but not enough to, to power the whole world. We can ask about geothermal. Geothermal, we have to dig down into the Earth's crust and try to get some of the radioactive energy, uh, nuclear uh, decay. Uh, that's what's actually heating the core of the planet and why we have a molten core still today. And from that, there's a lot of potential. So that is uh, an important area. But the problem is it's hard and expensive to get down to that energy. And there's only a couple places in the world where you actually get it really close to the surface. Iceland is one example, and uh, Yellowstone National Park is another. So then we get to solar. And what do you think? Uh, just do another show of hands. There's enough solar to power the whole world? Yes, thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> um, you guys are right, and you're very, very right. It's actually so great that it's out of whatever building you're in. I can guarantee that. And so it's about a thousand meters in the sky on this plot, on this chart with a reasonable monitor size. It's about a thousand meters in the sky. There's 180,000 terawatts striking the earth and we only need 16 terawatts. So we put in some, some realistic numbers, say we're only gonna cover 10% of our land area uh, sorry, one, one to 2% of our land area with a solar cell that's about 10% efficient. We can make solar cells that are 20% efficient now. We have modules that are easily 15 to 20, uh, depending on how much you want to pay for it. And so with that practical limitation, we still have enough to power the entire world many times over. And so to really understand why the others are so much lower, they're all essentially, except for geothermal, they're all derivatives of solar. So solar has the potential to power the whole world today. It's, I mean, we already have a solution. I, I should, should, should just go home, right? Except for the fact that I'm already home. Uh, so we don't do it. We don't do it because people don't know about it. They don't want to push for it. It's too expensive. And people don't know that it's actually gotten more affordable. And there's other issues that come up with deployment. It's hard to deploy in certain areas. Um, and uh, there's certainly... As, uh, factors like as aesthetics that can play a role as well. So that's what we try to do in our lab is try to overcome some of those bottlenecks. Just to put it into perspective, how much area we need to power the whole US, we, we are energy hogs. We use about a quarter of the world's energy and we consume about four terawatts at any given moment. And so this, is the, this green box represents about how much area we need in solar energy. We need to cover about 2% of our land area and that's about the area of 
the highway system in the US um, or the size of moderate state. So you can pick your least favorite state and just uh, pave them over in solar panels. A lot of people, whenever I ask students, they always pick Ohio for some reason. Um, but it would be a boon too. You know, wherever you do this, it's actually an economic uh, benefit and it creates jobs. So. so what we did in our group a number of years ago was to ask if there was a way to re-envision how solar cells work and how we can deploy them. If we could deploy them in new areas, we might be able to help this area problem. And so our thought was, you know, solar cells need to harvest some part of the solar spectrum. And that part of the solar spectrum is this sort of grayed line. Um, if we think about where we can see, we can plot the photopic response of the eye. This is the sensitivity. So we're most sensitive to green, uh, but we can see to about 400, 450 on the UV ultraviolet side and to about 650, 700 nanometers on the red side, red infrared side. And so traditional solar cells will just harvest all of the light from the UV through the visible into the near infrared. And they go quite a bit into the infrared. So silicon, the most common uh, module that you can find today absorbs to about 1100 nanometers. And this is the quantum efficiency. It shows that you absorb all of the wavelengths. And what we did was we said, can we take the nanostructure nature of the materials we were developing and use it to make a new kind of solar cell that actually doesn't harvest the visible part of the solar spectrum? Instead, we can now selectively harvest all of the invisible parts of the solar spectrum, so the ultraviolet and the infrared, and we can do that selectively and let visible light pass through. Then we can make a solar cell that's completely transparent. You don't even know it's there. So how does this work? Uh, if you think about a traditional solar cell like silicon, it's got a continuous band. Uh, it's a continuous band semiconductor. So you have all these levels that just continue up. And so if you want to, um, the absorption profile basically is flat, roughly flat. And so if you want to absorb light anywhere, you're going to absorb all the colors and uh, across the UV visible and infrared. So you get a trade-off. You can either make it transparent and make it really thin or you spatially, you punch holes in it um, and you either get transparency or you get power, you get one or the other. And it's really difficult to balance that. Uh, but with these molecular materials, we now fundamentally change how we do this. And instead of just having a traditional band gap, like over here with a continuum of states, we actually now break this up and we get a discrete set of states called molecular orbitals. And if we separate these molecular orbitals enough, we can create essentially a second band gap where visible light won't get absorbed. And um, so we can now design this to have a band gap in the infrared so that we absorb the infrared. We absorb, design the second band gap so we don't absorb visible light. And we can tune this so that we can selectively harvest UV only or UV plus near infrared or only near infrared. And we've designed a whole catalog of these molecules that now enable this kind of functionality and this kind of feature. And we can integrate those materials into solar cells. And that's what we've done. So let me, I'm gonna switch over here and hopefully I don't, uh, don't mess up my screen sharing. I'm gonna jump over to my camera. And here we have a transparent solar cell. It's one of the first modules we actually ever made. So you can see my hand behind it. It's just a little module. These, this is what we make in our lab for you know, the first devices, okay? I'll plug it in. And we have two flashlights here. So we see we have a nice regular <laughs> flashlight. That's not the one we want to use, right? Oh, am I sharing right now? Only seeing you. Oh, sorry. Let's see if that's working now. This is our little transparent solar cell. So you can see my hand behind it. Actually, I can just put it up here and you can still see through it. Plug it in. Okay. Now, we can use our flashlight, but this isn't the one we want to use. What do we want to use? We want to use one that's invisible. So here's our visible light, and here's our extra flashlight. And what it's doing is harvesting the invisible, invisible light. So this is an infrared flashlight, and it's harvesting just the infrared and ultraviolet. But this is 
in particular is just harvesting infrared. Now that's that's you know where, where we start with our um, with our lab type demonstrations. Now we're making things that look like this. So I'll talk about more. I'll talk about more about that in a second. Now let's see if I can get back to this. My, can you see full screen? Yes. Okay. So I just want to talk for a few minutes about how these devices work. And you might have some concept from thinking about silicon, but these devices work a little bit differently. So in this materials, uh, the dielectric constant is so low that when you excite an electron in, in these materials, you don't just create free carriers like you would in silicon. Instead, you're going to shine light onto these materials. And I'm going to show this schematically both in real space and in energy space. You shine light, it excites an electron from the uh, uh, highest occupied molecular orbital to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. These are sort of molecular orbital equivalents of conduction band and valence bands. And we create this excited state. And normally, the electron would just fly off and in silicon, and you don't have to worry too much. But in this case, it creates an electron hole pair, and that electron hole pair actually dance around each other because they're coulombically interacting and want to come back together. Positive one wants to match with negative. And so you have about a nanosecond to do something with this excited state before it'll just recombine and form uh, a photon of light. It'll either form photon, photon of light or it'll create heat. And so then you've just wasted that energy. So uh, some 30 or 40 years ago, uh, researchers figured out that you need to create an energy offset to actually dissociate this excited state. And so what you now have to do is have this excited state diffuse to this interface where you've created an energetic driving force to separate this excited state. And once you've done that, now you've really weakened these, these interactions and the electron and the hole can just fly apart and they get collected to the electrodes uh, where you create current. And because the potential difference between the electrodes and the holes in the electrons, you get a voltage. And you get a voltage, you have electrons flowing through the circuit, so you get current, and so you can create power. So the ultimate result is very similar to a silicon solar cell, but how this works and how this is optimized is very different than a silicon solar cell. You have this extra design element that you have to think about with exciton diffusion and exciton dissociation. So you have these extra bottlenecks. But if you can overcome those bottlenecks, it enables you to make these transparent solar cells. And there's a whole variety of tricks that we play to actually make these solar cells more efficient. Um, we, we started off with our very first demonstrations at an efficiency of about 1%. And we've grown rapidly. And long story short, we're sort of you know, at 10% or above. Um, but one of the tricks that we use to overcome the exciton bottleneck is instead of just making planar uh, header junctions, we actually blend those two materials together so that you have less distance that the exciton has to diffuse. And so the way that we do that is we blend them together while we're growing the layer. And if you blend it together in just the right way, you can start to increase the efficiency. And that was sort of one of the first approaches that we showed. We also think about trying to design these molecules with longer exciton diffusion length. This is a really fun and interesting problem. Um, there is tricks that we can play in the crystals. The crystals are very anisotropic, they're not cubic. Um, and so if we orient the crystal one way versus another, um, the material actually looks different. It actually looks, has a different color, uh, has different electrical properties, and so we can exploit that. So we, we play tricks to get the crystals to orient a particular way. We also do a lot of optical interference. This is something that um, we usually think of beer lambert's law. And if you have some absorption profile, as you make something thicker and thicker, your absorption you know, decays exponentially. And so you get more, more, less, less and less transmission as you go thicker and thicker. So your transmission decays exponentially. But when you're in very thin films uh, on the order of the wavelength of light, you get really weird effects where your absorption profile actually goes like a sine wave. And so you can make one thickness that has great absorption you double the thickness and the absorption goes down by a factor of three. So really non-intuitive, really non-linear effect. Um, and we've written models to be able to 
understand this and exploit this and um, actually design not only enhanced performance, but also enhanced angular uh, impact. So um, that's also really important because most solar cells don't get exposed to sunlight just at normal incidence. So optical inter interference is really important in fact. And then we just synthesize a lot of materials. We take what we know about materials that we like and work, and then we make new versions. And once you realize that you can make a solar cell like this, it really sparks your imagination. You start, start to think about deploying this anywhere and everywhere. So in tall buildings um, where there's a lot more area in the vertical footprint than there is in the rooftop footprint, anywhere where you have skylights, you can now have great natural lighting any, in any space. Um, in a tall building, it'll actually have multifunctional purpose. It'll actually help reject infrared heat, which is solar heat from coming into the building. And so you actually reduce your HVAC cost, which is the single largest energy cost in a building. Um, so a lot of technologies actually exist where they just do passive low E um, reflection of the solar heat. And we do something one step better because we do that and we also convert it to electricity. Um, you can think about employing this on uh, electric vehicles to extend their range or make it so that you don't have to plug them in as often or maybe never again. Uh, you can think about integrating on greenhouses and double up the space where you're growing food and now creating power. Uh, it can enhance functionality of devices. So if you wanted a smart window where you could turn it into a self-privacy window, um, it's often hard to think about where you're gonna draw power from. But if you can create onboard power, then you just make this self-powered autonomous product. And so it enables a lot of other technologies to become more viable. And you can now think about integrating it on mobile electronics so that Again, you plug it in less often and maybe never again. So a lot of really interesting, exciting applications that now emerge because of this new functionality. And so you can install not only on new installations, uh, but we can also do it on plastic and make flexible uh, versions where we can retrofit existing buildings because a lot of buildings already exist. So we see this as a totally new paradigm for solar, totally new way of thinking about how to deploy solar and really being a complement to traditional solar. So where we can do traditional solar, we should. But where we don't have that luxury, we now have a new way to make it happen. Um, and just the market for uh, window surface area in the US alone is about 4 billion meters squared at about, if you say you're gonna compete at 10, 12 cents a kilowatt hour, that translates into a $100 billion market, so it's huge. So what did we do when we sort of piece this together? Oh, uh, there's some synergies. I sort of already mentioned these. Uh, but when we looked at this market potential for that one application alone, it was huge. And so we started a company. And that company is called Ubiquitous Energy. And they're out in Redwood City in Silicon Valley. We're hoping to one day rename Silicon Valley. Um, but I like the tagline. Uh, it's pretty clever. I, I didn't come up with it, but our, our first CEO uh, actually did, our, one of our co-founders. And uh, it's solar like you've never seen it. So that, I think that's pretty clever. The company has grown quite a bit. We've raised over uh, $40 million. Uh, we have about 30 employees at the moment, uh, but that'll be growing in the near future. We just finished building our first pilot production line. And you can see we've started making these window size units. Um, it, takes, it takes a good 10 years to bring something from the lab scale to actual commercial deployment. So it does take some time, uh, but it's been a pretty amazing journey and we, we've uh, overcome some pretty amazing hurdles and it's great to actually, we're gonna have the first uh, installation outside of the company. So we have an installation inside the company, actually it's the back wall there, but the first installation outside the company will actually be on MSU campus. So you should keep your eye out for that. It'll be installed on the south entrance to the Biophysical Sciences Building, BPS. And a lot of times people ask, well, you know, if you're not harvesting the visible light, how efficient could this really be? And I think that's a natural question. And the answer is pretty surprising. So the efficiency limit for a opaque junction like silicon, the maximum efficiency is 33%. You cut out all the visible light and the efficiency only drops modestly to this black curve of, of about 20%. So if you think about silicon, <laughs> it gets more than half its power from the infrared. more than half of its power from the infrared. And that's why this whole idea can work so well. 
Now, we can make these cells with different um, band gaps and stack them together to make a multi-junction cell. And if we make multi-junction cells, we can actually go up to an efficiency above 35%. And if we allow ourselves to actually absorb a little bit of visible light, <coughs> excuse me, we can go above 40%. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, it's rough. Okay, so uh, that was sort of our journey in inventing new solar panels. Uh, those are going to be uh, coming out into the market uh, fairly soon. So that's something you can keep your eye on. Definitely keep your eye on ubiquitous energy. Um, Another question I often get as, we're, as I go around the, the country and around the world talking about solar and these new kinds of technologies is, you know, can you really do solar in some place like Michigan? You know, a lot of places they say, oh, it's, there's, there's not enough solar energy here. You know, in Europe, they say that a lot. But if you look at it, here's the um, solar flux across the country. And so you normally think, well, it only makes sense in the Southwest. But if you actually look at it closely, these colors are pretty high on the scale. And if you look at how many kilowatt hours per meter square day you get in Lansing versus Phoenix, it's, you know, it's higher in Phoenix for sure, but it's only about 50% higher. So 5.8 versus 3.8, you 50% higher. So 1.5 times higher. That is not that much different. And, but it can make a big difference in the cost. I would argue that at this point we've gotten so good that it's it's not even that important. But um, there is plenty of sunlight in Michigan, and um, one of the reasons is because we actually get really good long summer days, and so it's sort of we get more of our sunlight during the summer. Uh, but overall, balanced throughout the year, we do have a lot of solar energy. Now, I, I give you the numbers both on, on a flat plate horizontal installation or for a 45 degree tilt. But the bad news for Michigan is a lot of other things. It's not how much sunlight we have. It's how we set up our systems to encourage or discourage solar adoption. And so we have a whole variety of things here. This report card is, I think, actually a little bit too positive. Um, so there's a whole variety of factors. So we have the renewable portfolio standard that says, you know, how, many, how much percentage of our energy is mandated to be from renewable energy sources. And that's something like 15% by 2021 and 35% by 2025, but it's non-binding. And I don't think that's good enough. Um, so that gets a sort of middle of the road grade. Solar carve out are things like uh, renewable energy credits. Um, if you want to get uh, payout for renewable energy credits, you actually have to go to like Ohio. Um, we get a good grade on electricity costs because we actually pay a lot for our electricity. And I would ask you guys, how much do you pay in your bill? Uh, the key is to actually add up your total monthly bill and divide it by the, the kilowatts, kilowatt hours, because most of the time they'll tell you how much you're getting charged, how many cents per kilowatt you're paying, but they don't include the distribution costs, which can also often be four to six cents a kilowatt which can drastically change how much you actually are paying and how much you would compare to a, a solar installation. Net metering is currently a, a B, but um, there's been a lot of um, discussion about that possibly going away. And I, um, I think that that's an area of major concern. An even greater area of concern is just the interconnection alone. Um, this is something I actually talk with Mark Haggerty about all, all the time, and I'll bring him up again in a minute. But you know, there's, there's limits to how, much, how many solar arrays can actually be connected to the grid. And right now they're capped at ridiculously low numbers, like one or 2%. And once they hit that cap, they're not obligated to allow other people to interconnect. And that's really a major problem. And, and politically, we need to eliminate that as a hurdle and a roadblock. Um, we have no tax credits. You, could, you can argue one way or the other. We already subsidized fossil fuels three to one in the wrong side. So you know, we could balance that out a little better at least. Um, it would be great if we actually had some tax credits or rebates, but we don't. Uh, we do have a federal tax credit, which is very important. And that's about 22%. It previously was about 30%. So that still exists and hopefully that'll continue for the foreseeable future. 
Uh, property tax exemption was an F, that just changed this past year. So if you installed solar as a, in a residential location in Michigan, up until last year, it would have increased your property taxes. And that actually plays a role in how we designed our solar array. Um, we had to get around that because we knew that was a problem. But there's now an exclusion so that uh, residential owners up to about $80,000, you are exempt from any increases to your personal property taxes. So you should uh, feel a relief about that. Um, given all of that, um, the, the typical payback time is about 10 to 15 years and rate of returns are anywhere from six to 10%. So that's actually really good given that we have some problems. Um, and so I think a lot of people don't realize that the numbers are already pretty good and they should be looking at it today. So there's some things that we definitely need to work on. Uh, interconnection is a really big problem and we need to push on our politicians to start making some changes about that. Okay, so this is our solar array at our house. Uh, this was actually um, co-designed by myself and uh, by uh, Mark at Michigan Solar Solutions. And we were really working to overcome this property tax problem. Uh, we had a couple other issues that kind of popped up and um, ultimately we designed this array to be somewhat special. So if you look at it closely, it's got wheels. So why did we build this solar array on wheels? Well, we were gonna have our property taxes increased and by making a non-permanent structure, we were able to get around the property tax problem. Um, we also then gave ourselves insurance for if we ever moved. So if we, for some reason, had to leave Michigan, we would be able to bring them with us. And so this was something that we you know, really had to work on and it took us a few years uh, to come to this realization, design this, build it, put it together. Um, so this is somewhat of a, a unique array, uh, but I think there's some reasons why this could be interesting and exciting for a lot of other people too. I see there's a question. Yep. <laughs> and this is just a quick summary of uh, what we, what, what the specs of the system were and what we paid. Um, the solar system was 13 and a half kilowatts. Uh, upfront cost was 50,000. Uh, we had the federal tax credit of 30% and that translated into about $2 and 68 cents a watt um, installed. And so that's great. That's, um, I think it was close to a dollar per watt. And you know, that kind of number makes solar look compelling at almost every place in the country. So numbers are only getting better uh, from what I've seen. Um, with this system, we are expected to have a payback time of about 10 and a half years. And the ROI that we calculate is very close to 7%. Now, if you think about, if you have money and you want to do something with that, if you put it in a, in a CD, the best interest rate you're going to get today, if you're lucky, is 2%. So this is a great investment. And it's actually going to make you money over the length of the installation. And I think that most people don't realize that today. And I think if we can get more folks to just go ask for quotes, a lot of people will be surprised and shocked and would probably think about it more seriously. And the other thing that I think is important is um, not only is the ROI good and getting better, um, just lost my train of thought. <laughs> But anyway, we uh, kind of went all out with our system. We wanted to be sort of as self-reliant as possible. And so we went ahead and actually integrated battery storage into our system. And we were able to get Tesla power walls and Michigan Solar Solutions was actually able to do both the solar side and the power wall side, which was really great. Um, but Tesla was uh, also very critical. Um, they actually gifted us one of our power walls and we installed two. Um, we were able to get federal tax credit on all of them, the ones that we paid for. And ultimately that gave us 26 kilowatt hours of storage. And that's enough uh, to be able to get us through most days so that we don't even, you know, have to draw energy from the grid very much. In the winter we do, but um, uh, as I'll mention in a second, uh, electric vehicles can expand the capacity of this number quite a bit, 26 kilowatt hours if you think about that, that's about how much you would use in a modest size house on a given day, 26 kilowatt hours. Now, because we're producing solar through most, a good portion of the day, um, 
This can usually allow us to go off grid for several days as long as we have good sunny days. And electric vehicles, when coupled to this, could allow us to go for months. So this is why one of the reasons why electric vehicles are so important. But if you want to really understand why EVs are so important, a plot like this really helps you. So electricity is a huge part of our greenhouse gas, um, is the, a, a key part or source for greenhouse gas emissions. So it's this uh, blue box, uh, blue triangle here on the bottom. Transportation is a much bigger pie. Transportation is incredibly inefficient. And if, if you look at the total fractions, about 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions comes from transportation. And about 25% of our total greenhouse gas emissions comes from light duty vehicles. Air travel is not that much, it's actually about 5%. So it's important, but the two biggest things that we can do are go solar and go electric. And by going electric, it allows you to then refuel by using solar energy. So it really enables transportation that's renewable. So this is the really, the, the three biggest things, if we combine transportation, electricity, and home, we can offset almost 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. So that's the biggest piece of this time. And that's why it's so important. And I like to talk about why EVs are so important. I know I'm running out of time. I'm supposed to give you guys more time for questions, but I'll just talk about this for a minute or two. Um, the really great thing is they're zero emission, um, much lower emission than a internal combustion engine. If you couple it with solar, the emissions essentially go to zero if, for the whole life cycle analysis. Um, their efficiency is much better. So you get more than 100 miles per gallon equivalent for most good EVs. So uh, typical like a Lexus will get like 25 miles per gallon. And you're gonna get four times that in an electric vehicle. And you're also gonna produce the power more efficiently. So an internal combustion engine is only 30% efficient, but a cogen power plant that's recapturing the steam energy uh, and converting that, you're gonna get about 60% conversion efficiency. Um, your performance of an electric vehicle is phenomenal. Night and day difference. If anybody's ever interested in just going for a ride in EV, uh, feel free to contact me because it is an eye opener. The first time you ever ride in an EV, you go, wow. Uh, so there's instant torque, huge horsepower, acceleration is just like you're in a million dollar supercar. Maintenance, there's none. Uh, on the first three years of ownership, we have only replaced the wiper blades. Um, and we're just about to re replace the tires. And so that's about all we've had to do. So no oil changes, no timing belts, um, none of that. You can save a lot of money on fuel costs. So electricity is a lot cheaper, especially if you go solar. Uh, and so you can save a lot of money on fuel costs. You're gonna save money on maintenance. They're among the safest cars ever made. Uh, many of EVs are the highest, safest, uh, highest safety rated cars by the government. There's no front engine block, so that's something that can crush you in an accident. Um, so you just get a, a dedicated crumple zone. And, um, and really it's about re allowing renewable energy to penetrate into all aspects of our lives. Because autonomous vehicles really need the lowest um, cents per mile or dollars per mile, it also is intimately linked to the ability to make viable autonomous networks, autonomous fleets, where you can have cars that are self-driving and just go around and be road with taxis. <laughs> so this is sort of a prediction of what is expected to happen. Ice cars are expected to get phased out and electric vehicles are expected to rise very rapidly. <laughs> Some people can argue about how wide this curve should be. But if you want to understand if this kind of phenomenon is real, all we have to do is look at the disruption from uh, any technological advance over the last 100 years, which I'll show you in a second. But it, if this is right, in six to seven years, you're not going to even be able to sell your internal combustion engine car. You're not even going to be able to sell it to somebody. So it's going to be hard to figure out what to do with it. <clears throat> so this is just an example from the last 100 years of every disruptive technology. <clears throat> and how quickly and how much of an S shape you get. And what do we notice as we get further along on this chart, as we get more technological, these disruptions happen faster and faster. And 
So you can argue about how fast the EV transformation is going to happen, but it's going to happen like this S curve, and it might be five years, it might be ten years, um, but it's almost guaranteed to happen. And so it's good to uh, to take a look at it. And one of the things that a lot of people always say is, "Well, I can't afford an electric car. I can't afford a, a Tesla." And and in particular, they say that about Tesla. Um, but I think people will be surprised if you actually look at the total five-year cost of ownership. Um, you look at the purchase price first and you say, yeah, it's way higher than all these other cars. But you factor in the fact that you'll actually pay less for your fuel. You'll pay less, surprisingly, for your insurance. We saw this. Our insurance went down by a factor of two, going from a Honda Civic to a Tesla. And you're going to have much better resale value. It maintains its value much better. They get over-the-air updates, so uh, you know they, they never really age. Um, and overall, then, the total cost of ownership is less than something like a Toyota Camry. And the cost per mile, therefore, is also less. And so you start to think about this. A, a Tesla will actually last 500,000 miles. The battery is rated to last 500,000 miles, and the drivetrain is rated to last a million. So this could be the last car that you ever have to buy. And because you get over the updates, you keep getting new features, and you just don't ever need a new car. So if you don't have to buy a new car in 10 years, that changes the cost dynamic even more so. So I think it's pretty interesting to realize that a Tesla Model 3 is, can be affordable for a lot of people. If you're looking at buying a new Toyota Camry, you might as well go and look at a Tesla Model 3 and maybe take it for a spin and see what you think. So this is sort of our whole picture. This is our solar array. These are our power walls that store the energy for nighttime. And these are our cars that get powered by our solar arrays and by our power walls. And everything is electric. Um, every, it's a beautiful system and everything is interconnected. So if the power goes out, the power walls kick on and we maintain energy seamlessly. Um, if we're producing an excess of power, you know that power can go into our cars and get stored in our cars. Um, Fairly soon, I expect I'll turn on vehicle to grid uh, interaction, and that'll be an over the air update, I expect. Um, so that when the power goes out, uh, the power walls can actually then pull from our cars. So they don't necessarily need to pull energy from our cars now um, because we don't want to put cycles on them. But this would expand our 26 kilowatt hours in our test uh, power walls to um, closer to 200 kilowatt hours, and we could be off grid indefinitely. So um, it's really beautiful synergy. And one of the reasons that we got into all of these systems, one of the first things that we bought that was all electric was an electric lawnmower. And we were amazed at how good it was. And that got us realizing that electric propulsion is actually really, you know, it's coming around and what electric vehicles can do now are just stunning. And so we've gone totally electric in our cars. We'll never go back. And I love, I love this picture of our cars because there, there's a, we have three of them and, and one is for our son and he just absolutely loves it. So you can get them for all ages too. Uh, but I'll just you know, mention that I'd like to thank my group. They're the ones who do a lot of the research that allow us to build these technologies. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. I have a question. Yeah, I've got a, just a question. First of all, uh, rare earths, this is, I mean, this is a very exciting efficiency, mind blowing. But uh, an issue with rare earths, in the with this tech construction and secondly uh, how what would be the cost do you think per kilowatt are produced compared to traditional all things being equal compared to traditional solar panels ah in our solar panels so we actually use carbon carbon based molecules so there's no rare earths Great. no platinum iridium phosphorum any, uh, platinum uh, iridium or anything like that um, so in general, we actually expect our, the cost of our solar panel dollar per watt to be less than a traditional panel. It's a very thin layers. We only need about 100 nanometers of active material. And it's just a coating that goes on to an existing glass, of, uh, a glass panel. And you're going to do the, the window anyway, right? So if you're planning to install a window, and all you're doing is putting on the extra coatings, the incremental cost looks very small. And so the, the premium that you pay may be like a 5 to 10% premium on your window, but that's just getting like a fancy premium window. 
And you could already pay for that premium in a, in a dumb low e-coding passive window. So we think the cost is going to, we're, we're piggybacking on the infrastructure. So anybody that installs solar will tell you, you know, the balance of systems is, is, is very expensive. The installation, the racking, um, those components cost a lot of money, but we get that for free basically because somebody's already going to pay for that anyway. So the cost actually looks really good. So where you can do transparent solar, the cost actually looks even better. Thanks. Uh, this is Karen. I have a couple of questions on the material strength. Do you have to worry about things like birds, rocks, uh, children, branches up trees, leaves, stuff like that? <laughs> well, ultimately, we're integrating these in like uh, IGU, what we call IGU units. It's double pane uh, glass. And so it's as strong as a regular window would be. But we can also make them flexible. And so you could think about integrating them as like a lamination that you roll out. Like you can get privacy film that you just roll on the inside of a window. And you could potentially do the same thing with this kind of technology where you laminate on the inside of the window. And then you don't have to worry about any of that other stuff. You have, you have to worry about kids, you know, maybe pulling at it or something like that. But it'll be integrated. They won't even know it's there. So. Um, well, then you have to have wire it all together, right? You do. So the way that you do that is actually... The way, the, um, the way that these modules are built right now, everything's embedded in the frame. And, and then you can get um, every, everything kind of clips together. So you have these connectors that just sort of snap around various pieces of the window. And so everything just looks like it's part of the frame. What's the useful life on these materials? So, if sil uh, silicon is like 25 years. That, that's right. So we're, we're meeting the specifications of the window industry. Um, and so they do th thousand hour continuous testing. So we meet all that performance criteria. Um, we can do extrapolated lifetime testing and it looks like it's more than 10 years, um, but it's hard to know because we haven't sent any, like the difference between 15 and 25 years is you kind of have to put them out in the world for that long. Right. Um, it's almost hard to extrapolate that length. And so, um, but, but it looks very good. We're, we're, we, we feel like we've solved pretty much all the lifetime problems. There are organic materials that you can play with that will die and photo bleach and won't last very long. But you look at the OLED industry, and that's a great example. You know, these OLEDs are rated to last 10, 20 years. Um, so we, we've, across the board, across a range of functions, um, you know, things, we, organic materials can last for a very long time. When has, has ubiquitous gone public or is it still privately held? Yeah, that's a great question. No, we are not, we are not public. We are privately held. Um, I'll let you all know when we're going to go public. <laughs> Thank you. I'll give you all the inside scoop. Um, you know, as with anything else that when you have a good idea, I will, I will mention that there are a number of companies that have followed our approach. Um, we were the first to invent this technology. And there's hundreds of researchers around the world that have now jumped into this research field. So, I mean, I literally started this field and we have the original patents on this, uh, but there are a lot of people working on it now and, and a couple of companies that are sort of following our lead. And anytime somebody copies you, I think it's the sincerest form of flattery. It means you're really doing something. And um, there's actually a company uh, that copied us uh, just a couple of years ago and they, they had already gone public. And so um, there is a public company out there that looks very much like us, but um, they're, they're a follower, so. Um, Are they US-based or international yeah, somewhere? Yeah, there's, there's a couple around the world. I mean, um, anytime you have a good idea, the people will sort of uh, jump onto the bandwagon, and I would say that's happened around the world. Researchers and companies around the world, yeah. So I can we're, still, we're, we're still definitely the leaders, not only in performance, uh, but we're also pretty much the closest to bringing our products to the market. We have installations that we've been building and um, so we're, we're pretty excited. I understand that guys like Tesla but the spontaneous combustion really freaks me out. Really? Yeah. Did you see, I, I forgot to highlight this, uh, let me see, this quote here at the bottom, after driving a Tesla every other car seems stupid. That was said by my wife. Well, I've got a hybrid. It was from 2009, and I like it. It took a while to get adjusted to it, but um, 
the spontaneous combustion really freaks me out. I, I, you mean the, every oh, time. Oh, the spontaneous, like the, the very fast acceleration? No, I, I mean like the burning up to a crisp thing. Burning up to a crisp, what do you mean? Oh, oh like, the Teslas like fires, that are- fires. Yes. Oh, oh this is um, a very interesting phenomenon. <laughs> That's my song. <laughs> yes. So um, they're actually very rare. It, you're far more likely to have a combustion, uh, a combustion, a combustion event to happen in an internal combustion engine car. Um, they're very rare. Um, so that's one thing. They're actually the, the, the packs are extremely well encased. It's it's um, like a titanium shell around it. In fact, it's structural. So people have driven these cars at like 80 miles per hour into brick walls and walked away with scratches. They're literally the safest cars ever made and never tested by the government. Um, I, I think what happens with a disruptor is you're going to see other interests get involved. So what is the oil industry going to do when suddenly that disruption curve gets to the point where they can no longer sell, you know, internal combustion engines. And so that means that they can't sell as much fuel. Like they have a vested interest to see electric vehicle makers fail. And yeah. most short sellers, uh, even Jim Cramer has said, if you're short selling, you're not creating fear, uncertainty, and doubt about a disruptor that's disrupting your industry, then you're, you're, you're not trying. And so I think you see when these do happen, it gets overemphasized. Like, you know, there's a handful of instances where that happened. And, you know, even for like the last year or two, I haven't even heard of an incident happening. Uh, but it gets it gets blown up in in sort of the media when an event like that happens, and and it's I think very very rare. They're very safe cars. Hey, uh, Richard, this has been great. Uh, why don't you stop the screen sharing? It'll be easier to see the participants then. Oh sure. And I think we have a question from Diana. <clears throat> um, a couple of them actually. Uh, one was triggered by Karen's question. If you uh, put this material into a window in your home. Um, what's the inf uh, effect of a screen? Ah, okay, yeah, good question. So, because, well, so we can design these cells to actually be what's known as bifacial. So they can harvest light from both sides. Mm -hmm. um, when we really optimize it for particular applications, like most of the time we're really optimizing it for performance on one side, mm -hmm. um, but we can do sort of bifacial. If it's bifacial, a screen will then impact the impact, you know, the, um, the performance from that side. Um, where bifacial is actually becoming important is actually in solar arrays that are ground mounted. So there's solar albedo that comes in. And so if you look north and in any given day, you shouldn't see the sun, right? Because the sun is right. behind you, but yet it doesn't look dark. Why is that? That's because they're scattering from the atmosphere, they're scattering from the surface. Mm -hmm. And so by making traditional silicon panels bifacial, you can actually increase the performance. And there's a lot of interest in sort of uh, developing those kinds of modules. Yeah. Um, and so you could think about that for the transparent things too, but um, ultimately the screen is gonna be on the wrong side to hinder the majority of the performance. Huh. My screens okay. are on the inside of the house exactly. because I have casements. That's exactly right. Okay, yeah. and yeah. what my main, main concern is this. Um, humans and, and plants and everything evolved being exposed to the entire spectrum coming from the sun. Yes. Um, what is the effect on biological organisms of having some of it interrupted? And Absolutely. have you tried this in a greenhouse? MSU would be the perfect place to do yeah. that kind of biology research. In fact, we're doing that right now. <laughs> that's an ongoing project. So that's a great suggestion. Um, it's one we've been thinking about for some time. And we actually are literally have made hundreds of these panels that mm -hmm. we are testing out in greenhouses. And we're actually doing that specific experiment. You know, we have to think about what our vision is, is different than other biological systems. So for us, we know the photopic response very well. And in fact, you're, a lot of people are already probably sitting behind, if you have a premium window, you probably already have a low E coating in it, which means you're already rejecting the solar heat gain, which means you're rejecting solar light. So you've been living behind this type of, essentially this kind of technology for a long time. You just haven't been generating electricity from it. Um, <laughs> so 
uh, we're not worried about that in terms of the impact on humans. There is no particularly known function of infrared on humans. Um, but in plants, the story could be different and we're trying to figure that out. And so we've been actually looking at, because we have the tunability where we can move that absorption edge to wherever we want. So we can make a cutoff at 650 nanometers or 700 nanometers or 750 nanometers. We can now sort of optimize for plant vision. And that is what we are actually trying to do. And so we're starting to understand what we can and cannot do with plants. And we actually have some really exciting data um, that really shows, you know, how we need to do that design. And, and well, it'd so, be interesting to uh, try some of John Ott's experiments um, <laughs> on, you know, streaming and uh, that sort of thing, and mm -hmm. with with this film between the um, the light source and the plants. Absolutely, that's a great thought. So, and we see greenhouses as a really important area, not only to make self-powered greenhouses, but just power producing. Power right? producing so yeah. that you can have a greenhouse in your backyard and hook it up to your house. Yep. Or your Tesla power wall. Yes, exactly. Cool. Richard, I have a question. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thinking about your comment on the uh, legal blocks to uh, implementation of distributed solar, seems to me that cladding a commercial building in transparent solar cells would not be favored by utilities. That's an example mm -hmm. of distributed power. And it would look like your commercial customers are not buying electricity anymore or less of it. Uh, what kind of impediments do you see in getting this to market because it disrupts the idea of central power provision and would expand distributed power? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that's actually surprising right now is because of the federal tax credit, our solar panels, they're going in as windows. But you know, you know this, and many of you might know that you get a tax credit on the whole system installation. So you actually end up making the, solar, the window cheaper in the end. You pay a premium, but then because of the tax credit, the owner actually saves money on their window. They actually get a cheaper window. Um, which is kind of amazing. So that's actually a help. Uh, but what hindrance is, I think there's, there's things about, you have to look at building codes a lot more carefully, uh, especially because these are now electrified surfaces. And so you have to think about that. You have to think about birds. Um, and I think with birds, there's actually uh, ASTM standardized testing for, you know, bird, you, you know, they'll put windows side by side in this wind tunnel and they'll actually test for which windows birds will preferentially go towards. Um, but I think that ours will ultimately be more noticeable to birds and so actually better for birds. Um, that's my expectation. Um, but regulation wise, I don't actually see major hurdles at the moment. Um, things can kind of pop up that can surprise you. And like you said, there can be um, industries that kind of let things go by until it gets big enough and then they kind of want to push back. I think you see this in, in uh, Michigan. There was a big push to prevent Tesla from selling their cars in Michigan for a long time. And, you know, the regulators won and then they just lost in court recently. And now they're proposing they just passed a bill in the House to again prevent Tesla from being able to sell their cars, which I think is not only crazy for consumers, but just a bad deal for people wanting to reduce pollution. And, um, and so these things can kind of pop up and, and, and I, don't, I don't see anything at the moment, but that's not to say that there won't be things that pop up. And I don't know how strong the, you know, the grid lobby, you know, the uh, power generation lobby. The merchants is. out. It's very strong, but one <laughs> way you might think about it is if the transparent windows never approach anywhere near the power consumption of the building. So it would never be a grid-tied system. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would only be behind the meter. I mean, I don't know that's what- That's a possibility. The, I mean, that, 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 that's one possibility. I mean, it's, it's the same problem right now with interconnection. And the fact that we're limited on interconnection, I don't know how interconnection sort of plays out in those numbers commercially. Um, so that's a consideration that we'd have to, you know, with but that that's going to vary state to state 
Um, and so there may be these hurdles that pop up in specific areas, um, but you know, that's the kind of thing that we'll deal with as it kind of comes along. And you just have to kind of keep fighting back on those things. And eventually you talk to enough people and you get uh, enough people to realize that the benefit is not only in the CO2 emission, it's also on your wallet, you're actually gonna save money, then people are gonna demand these kinds of things. And once you get a, a strong enough chorus, you know, beating on the doors of politicians, then they're gonna change, change these things. But we need a large vocal crowd to really be fighting for these things, whether it's for Tesla or for changing the interconnection limits. You know, I think we need to be pretty vocal about how important this is. So is it, is it true or false that, uh, that the Tesla can't sell in Michigan because they, they don't want to have their own dealerships, but, but they want to do a direct sale? Isn't, isn't that what, what at least has been held up as the, as the problem? That, that was the problem for uh, quite some time, basically a decade, and that changed. They, they settled a court, um, uh, a court proceeding, and they gave them a loophole so that they could sell them. So they actually have built their first service center and sales center in Clarkston, Michigan. It's a, it's a nice it's a nice outlet. It's a great place to go if you ever are looking for something to do fun on the weekend. Call call them up and schedule a test drive and just go down there and have some fun. I would highly recommend that. I'm not paid by Tesla, by the way. I'm just a fanatic. I, I just love what they're what they make. I believe in it and. I love what it means in terms of allowing renewable energy. But now they just introduced a new law that just passed the house, I think this past week, that would prohibit Tesla from actually selling directly to customers in Michigan. So they're trying to re-enable that, that blocking law. And it would have to pass the Senate and then get signed by the governor. So it's not clear what will happen, but I think people can certainly get vocal about that. Um, so right now they can actually sell direct. Um, the way that they got around that before, like when we bought our cars, it was, we bought our first one three years ago and then we bought our second one two years ago. It took about a year for my wife to borrow my car. And then she realized, oh, I don't want to go back to the stupid car. And yeah, we, have, we have three EVs, uh, <laughs> one of them for the, uh, for the farm and then uh, two to drive around in. And, and so um, we only have five kilowatts of, of, uh, of uh, solar panel power but that's enough to keep our things going. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in your cost here. You say for 13.5 kilowatts, um, no. uh, the transparent uh, panels cost about $50,000. Now, what, what uh, is that the cost oh, those weren't of transparent. manufacturing? Those, Does that no, take no, into sorry, sorry. assumptions? Those, those panels were panels that uh, we installed with, with Michigan Solar Solutions. Um, they also do not pay me, but I think that they do a fantastic job. And if you're looking at it in a way, there's certainly somebody you should contact and consider. Mark Haggerty, I think he might be on here. Um, he's, he's the uh, president and fantastic guy and will help you work through any kind of challenges that arise. Yeah. Um, but that was for an opaque away. That was, that oh, was 50,000 oh. for an opaque away. Oh, sorry. I thought that was a transparent yeah. array. Uh, and it no, was I think our array scaled up production and stuff like that. Okay. No, no, we're, we're working on scaling up production right now. Um, it'll, you know, we're doing, we have a pilot production line so we can do pilot installation projects and we're doing, we have a couple slated to do around the world. Um, but we're, we're actively working towards a manufacturing line and we've, I, I didn't mention this, but we've partnered with two of the largest class manufacturers in the world. So I think that gives you a sense of, you know, how, how much momentum we have to be able to partner with, you know, class companies that big. So how did Michigan State uh, entice you to move from MIT? <laughs> uh, by giving both my wife and I jobs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and they've also, I mean, Michigan State, we, we love Michigan State. Uh, oh, hi, Sam. Hey, you want to say hi to everybody? This is our son, Sammy. Um, so, Michigan State, you know, we've been. Hey, Daddy. Can, can you let Daddy finish? Can you let Daddy finish for a couple minutes? Okay. So, we, we've been. A, some great institutions. And I would say that the students at Michigan State, the best of the students at Michigan State are the best anywhere in the world. And so that's one thing that we really love about Michigan State. Uh, but they, they don't have, um, you know, people with egos and 
I think the, the faculty are really fantastic and it's that environment that makes it really appealing. And if you think of, I mean, I grew up, my wife and I grew up on the East Coast and we have a company on the West Coast. So we're always flying back and forth to the coast. And every time we come home, we're just, we just, we just release and are so happy to be back in Michigan. Um, it's just such a beautiful state. So that really helps. Well, I'm really excited that the ag department is trying to find the best way to uh, deal with the area underneath the 100 acres that has been uh, negotiated with NextEra. Yeah. Um, that's gonna be uh, a special place to grow vegetables in partial shade, uh, to uh, maintain uh, wildlife habitat and stuff like that. I think they'll do an exceptional job of uh, transitioning this from industrial setting to a collaborative uh, setting with the environment. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot, of, you know, you look at um, some of the areas of strength for MSU and yeah, the Ag, Ag College is definitely an area where we shine. And we're, we're you know, we're, we're not only looking at greenhouses for our technology, but we're also starting to look at, you know, MSU has one of the largest, has the largest solar carport in the world. And, <laughs> So it, it powers, um, I want to say 5% of the campus right now, and it's going to grow to be something closer to 15%. And that is really exciting. But, you know, if we can think about some of the ag area where we could do a solar carport, but take our technology and make it so that, you know, you can have the equivalent of a solar carport over all these areas, um, then you can even double up on area where you don't necessarily need a greenhouse, but you just have ag land. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity to actually demonstrate and showcase that on campus. And so that's something that we've been sort of thinking about and also talking about. But we need, we need to understand first what design criteria we can play with and what will impact plants and what won't impact plants. What is, what is the true plant vision? That's what we need to understand. Yeah, and we're working on that. Is it, is it time to change how we uh, structure utilities? Right now, they are monopolies in, in large part. Yeah. Uh, and, and before, when there were uh, windmills and um, uh, water energy only, um, you know, it, was, it was not a monopoly, but, but, uh, but when you had localized power generation, like with coal, you had to do something to give someone permission to, to be the exclusive provider of that, or else there would be so many redundant systems, it, it'd be a problem. But has anyone explored, and I think that, uh, that uh, Illinois has some of these uh, laws now, you know, explored um, uh, changing the system so that the, um, so that the uh, utilities would not have uh, the monopolies over electrical energy, and somehow there, there would be like, like uh, highways uh, that could be used to transmit the electricity somewhere else, but, but the generation could be competitive. So I think there's a lot of people thinking about this and there's a lot of ways to try to attack it. Um, I like to think about this, you know, there's sort of tiers and you need, if you really want to address it at like the state level, you really have to get political. Um, and that's not an area of particular expertise for me, but I do get very vocal with our Congress people and representatives. Um, so I encourage people to, to definitely sort of voice their opinions on these kinds of topics. Um, but I think like all of us can make an impact by just saying that we're gonna go do this. And you know, one, uh, one of the, sorry, I'm gonna get back to your point in a second. I wanted to make this point. The limitation for a lot of people is they say, I don't have enough money to do this right now, right? But if everyone took let's say their budget for charity and they cut it in half and they said, I'm only gonna give half to charity what I normally do. I'm gonna do all the same charities, but sort of half the contributions. And then the other half, I'm gonna put in a, 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 a bucket and I'm gonna save that up until I can do solar installation at my own house. I think that's one of the best investments that you can do because not only are you gonna pay yourself back that money, but it's gonna help save the environment for the future and help, you know, the, you know, help reduce smog and help reduce, you know, the toxins that we inhale every day. You know, there's, there's measurable pollution at intersections where cars are idling and then accelerating. 
And so even just walking around, you know, we're exposed to all this stuff and we, sh we shouldn't have to be. Uh, but coming back to this idea, so I think individually, as individuals, we can decide, you know, we want to go do the solar installation and maybe we do net metering. Or if you're willing to pay an extra penny um, or a lot of pennies, you can just do off grid. I mean, if you're willing to put in a big enough oversized solar array and an oversized battery system, you can go off grid and not allow the, those monopolies to dictate what you can do. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me is like, I, I was very close to doing that because I, it feels empowering. I don't, I want to take power away from those monopolies. Problem is, though, is that we have to go to scale. You yeah. know, if only high income people can afford to go off grid, then we're not going to get to scale. So just like some other people have mentioned, we need to break up the monopolies, open up the grid so everybody can get access to it. And we also need to provide low cost financing so middle class and working people can also participate in this renewable energy transition. Completely agree. Professor, I would like to congratulate you for actually transforming the solar industry with this type of technology. You are, uh, uh, it's beyond words. It's unbelievable, believable. So again, uh, I'm in, the, I'm, I work uh, with Mark and you uh, really just blew my socks off. So uh, oh, thank you. Excellent. You're excellent. here. Yeah. So will there, will there be some innovations in energy storage that can kind of keep up with the solar industry? Well, so yeah, if you look at the history of Tesla, when Tesla first started, they did not have batteries good enough for their plan, but they built towards their own Moore's law. So Moore's law, you know, says how good computing gets over time. There's sort of a Moore's law for batteries and it's just a slower progression, but they knew that in five to six years after they built their first, um, their first prototype and their first model, the Roadster, that it would be good enough. And so I think you're gonna see this march towards, you know, in the next 10 years, you're gonna see the energy density double and the cost half. And um, those kinds of things are gonna be transformational to the point where we should be doing everything we can politically, as vocal as we can be with politicians and we should be voting in people who are gonna support this, these agendas. Um, that could make a huge impact, but technologically, like, Many people today are still stuck in this mindset that solar is too expensive and that the return on investment doesn't exist. And it's and too scary and too uncertain and too... Yeah. And, and too they don't realize, Yeah. And so if they actually saw the numbers um, today, then they would, they would actually maybe give it some cons serious consideration. And I think solar plus battery is you know, quite expensive at the moment. It's, installing um, a storage is going to double or more than, you know, more than double your, your installation cost. But as those so, prices come down in the next 10 years, it will fundamentally transform people's ability to just go off and do it on their own. And so I think- What do you think really about hydrogen? What do you think about hydrogen? Hydrogen is an energy carrier. It's, you know, it's a, it's a method for storing energy. And so the question is, where do you get the hydrogen from? A lot of the natural gas Companies really want to push hydrogen because you know they can convert natural gas into hydrogen. Um, so it's another sort of product that they can sell from natural gas. From that standpoint, but you can, but you can hydrolyze water too, right? It's just maybe yeah, too so expensive. It's going to be very expensive. Um, so you you know once you create the hydrogen, you actually have to compress it, and so that mm -hmm. takes a lot of energy. And then storage and distribution is going to be a tremendous problem. How you distribute it around the country. So now, so there's a plant being built in, uh, in Saudi Arabia to use solar power and to uh, electrolysis on Earth and, and transport ammonia around the world. And so, yeah, so they're, look, they're trying to use ammonia as the conduit or the myth of moving hydrogen. Yeah, so ammonia, hydrogen, those are two of the most popular ones that people are considering and playing with. Um, you know, there, there's other things that we have to think about and be thoughtful of. As we scale up something like hydrogen, there was a, a paper from 2005, I believe it was in science that talked about how, you know, every time you plug in to a hydrogen station, um, if we scale this up and every car was hydrogen, there's a little leak that you have, a little hydrogen leak. And that, that little leak that you have, um, if we went to scale, would be enough to deplete our ozone layer. 
So there are other things that we have to start to worry about, secondary effects that we might not fully appreciate now with that kind of technology. But I think fundamentally, it, there are areas where, where it makes sense. Like hydrogen's already being used in like um, warehouse industries where they, they use hydrogen powered um, forklifts. And so I think there's a place for it, maybe even long haul trucking. But for the vast majority, I think you solved much of the problem with solar and battery alone. And I think hydrogen complicates things and makes it very expensive. Fuel cells are still really expensive. Those costs will eventually come down, but hydrogen fuel cells are also really expensive. And I think building the infrastructure, you know, electric vehicles have the advantage of the infrastructure is already all around us. The grid is already everywhere. So that infrastructure is built and that took a long time to build. And you look at why, why Tesla maybe stands out and is, is um, better than many of the other EVs is because of their supercharging network. And even that network, which piggybacks on the grid, took 10 years to build out. Um, but they're the only electric vehicle that you can drive across the country you know, in you know, a couple of days. Um, if you drive like a, a Nissan Leaf or a Chevy Volt, which I also think are pretty cool cars, you kind of get stuck after you go you know, 200 miles. You kind of got to wait. Unless you can, you, you can find a DC fast charger, which are still a little far and few between. Um, so, you know, I, th I think that's the reason I get pretty excited about Tesla is because it really enables people to kind of think about just regular, think about cars in their regular way and they can do trips. How are you now funding the company? So the company is all funded through uh, angel investors and uh, venture capitalists. Okay. And we've been fortunate. We've had a lot of ability, flexibility. We've had a lot of interest. And so we've been able to go uh, most of the way just in uh, uh, Angel. And the benefit of that is they are a lot, um, a lot more patient and a lot more fair. <laughs> and, and, and then so do you have any new funding series coming up or? Uh, so I don't think I could probably comment on that. We're, okay. We're always working on uh, sort of the next stage. Um, but, um, yeah, yes. And, yeah, okay. uh, I, I think it's okay. Yeah. I mean, we're always looking at the next round of funding. We've gone through like a, a round a of funding and, uh -huh. um, I, and so, yeah, it's something, okay. that, you know, if people well, are interested in contact that, you, you can, yeah. Okay. I'm always happy to get people connected if they're interested. Okay. Yeah. If you look in the chat column in this, uh, Zoom. Oh, yeah. I put an article there from uh, IEEE Spectrum, Spectrum on uh, getting off the grid as a community. Might be interesting to people. As you could, you can actually think of of the of the situations like Chelsea. Chelsea right now buys power from three companies, and they have the option to buy more or less from each of the companies. Uh, I think that they own some stock in DTE and in consumers, but, but they have a lot more freedom. It's not a monopoly for them because they have this uh, community power. Uh, they have their own people to do the billing and everything like that. And you can see little, you know, uh, uh, if allowed by law, you can see little communities popping up like Ann Arbor or something yes. like that. Yeah. And kind of taking their own, um, uh, taking some strength from themselves. So, so that's another area that uh, I, I really love. This happened in Lansing recently. Uh, there was a community solar project that just got uh, put together and it's, it's been running for a year or two now. And they built it over basically a, a trash dump and there was nothing else they were really gonna do with the land. And so they, they built an array and people in the community could sign up and pay for panels that basically offset their bill. And I think that this is a phenomenal model. I, I tried very hard to get my neighborhood association to mm -hmm. sign up for this and to, to try to build something like this. And I've thought about trying to do it for Williamston, um, but I think more communities, you can just decide as a community to do something like this and sort of bypass, um, you don't really bypass the power companies. You, you have to sort of work with them, uh, but it is possible to, to think about ways to actually bypass. And, if communities get together and, and are really willing to work work through that, I think there's ways to to do that as well. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's a ripe moment maybe for some disruptive company to come in, and, and maybe it's a new startup that's going to think about a new way to distribute power. 
and maybe it's going to take a, a, another disruptor from that front. Um, but in the near term, at least in the next five to 10 years, you know, I think the biggest things that are going to make an impact are individual consumers pushing for it and pushing their politicians and getting politicians that are going to create policies that make it easier to make these things happen. Well, Richard, I'd like to thank you again for this uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, th this has been a great discussion about all sorts of issues, but uh, you're kind of showing us the future of solar energy and energy, uh, in, you know, in general too, uh, with electrification of uh, buildings and vehicles. So uh, uh, we're right about uh, 820 now. So, uh, you know, if somebody has a really a question they would like to ask, now is a good time to do it. I'll stick around as long as you want me here, but this is, uh, was a lot of fun. So thank you again for attending and thank you, John, for the, the invitation. I'm sure. we, we, for folks. It's a pleasure to do it. Any uh, last questions before we adjourn? Yeah, I have a, a question actually. Go ahead, Dave. Um, could you talk about how the, uh, are, the, are the windows built up into a whole number of cells within one pane and like what kind of voltage do they get to and how do you oh, yeah. integrate power electronics or an inverter with it? Yeah, awesome question. So every module that you buy, if you look at it, it has cells oriented in either series or in parallel. And you have to put them together in series to build voltage. And so typically a module, you know, a single silicon solar cell only has a voltage of like 0 0.6, 0 0.65 volts uh, maximum, really. And, uh, but yet the module voltage is much higher. And that's because you string them together in series. And so we do the same thing. And it's just that you can't see how we do it because <laughs> we're quite clever. And so our cells are actually integrated. If you had like a, a microscope, you might be able to actually look at this. But we integrate our cells together in series and in parallel. And that module, this module that I showed, in, in noonday sun, this will output you know, about 30 volts. And you can string these modules together then to build however much voltage you want. It's a question of what, what voltage and what current do you want? And you sort of balance those things out. So the, la the, uh, the layers of material that you put on the glass are separated into individual cell sections and then they're linked together. Yep. And we do it all as thin film layers. Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. So we have to be clever about how we connect them. Sure. Yeah. But great question. Yeah, this is one of the interesting things, you know, I, I always, you know, try to give these lectures to high school students and even to undergrads. And we, we do a little game where we play with a solar cell that's this big and a solar cell that's, you know, this big. And we ask which one's going to power the fan. And the big one doesn't because they're all strung together in series and it's way too much voltage and not enough current. And, you know, and the students always guess wrong. But <laughs> Eventually, would, um, would an individual window be integrated with its own power electronics then? Oh, yeah. That was the other part of your question. Yeah. So actually, that's, that's sort of you know, part of the magic is we can do, there's different uh, thoughts about how to, to actually utilize the energy. And one way is like in a new build, all the windows would just get wired together. So there would be existing, you know, conduit and cabling and everything would get wired together and it would probably just go and to a centralized inverter and then you'd be grid connected. Um, and it would, it would probably be net metering type of thing. Um, but in uh, more isolated areas, uh, everything could be embedded in the frame and you can have interconnections between windows and then you could even just build, you know, isolated, you know, power units where you actually power something in that room or you maybe have your own outlet right there. Um, so there's a whole variety of ways that you can actually think about um, integrating it and utilizing the power. Um, one of the more elegant ways is just to use the power on board for whatever new function you wanted to add. So if you made a smart window, it just, it's powering the whole thing and everything, all the electronics are embedded around the frame. Yeah. So thanks. That's a great question. Yeah. Thanks again, Richard. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to have you come back in maybe a, a year or so just to give us an update. Uh, the technology sure. is changing so much. It'd be uh, interesting to have you come back and kind of, uh, especially maybe you'll come back in a year and have some uh, uh, windows to uh, solar windows to sell us. Sure. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, uh, I have a question. What is the effect of shade? I mean, we, with, uh, with our solar panels, there are some uh, walnut trees around so, you, so that you can get a little uh, dark stripe uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the PV, or if you have any electrical cable, go in front of it. Uh, you know, and that's why we have microinverters and stuff like that. But um, is it sensitive to shade in the same way that a, that a conventional uh, PV is? Yeah, so I would say that mo the, the primary effect is going to be the same sort of across the board. You shade a cell and the, the same kind of effect you're going to see. But there is a benefit with the materials that we use in that their low light sensitivity is better. So they actually get more efficient under lower light conditions. Mm -hmm. And so if there's some partial shading, that'll get compensated by that, that maybe small change in performance. And you'll actually do better under those conditions. So it's a secondary effect, but yeah, you, you know, you would see it okay. not drop off as fast as you would with the other technology. What about uh, temperature dependence? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, we haven't published anything on that, so I, I couldn't really talk about it. Um, but there's a whole variety of sort of like, a nap, like similar kinds of materials that show very good temperature dependence. Um, and that's something that we're kind of working on also right now. Um, but we test everything at, you know, one sun, which is noonday sun, thousand watts per meter squared. Um, they they get pretty warm, and we do our lifetime testing anywhere from sixty five to like eighty five degrees C. Um, so we, we we do a lot of testing in that in that in those ranges, and I would say that we're good, we're comparable, if not better, than most standard technologies in terms of temperature coefficient. Well, thank you everybody for attending and Richard again, thanks for uh, for this very interesting uh, presentation and discussion. My pleasure. Hey, take care everybody. Bye, everybody. See you next week. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>